something that happened on the cross is sometimes brought up um, in terms of how Jesus is portrayed in the Gospels. And Daryl, you wrote about this in Truth and a Culture of Doubt. Um, and this reminds me of sometimes if you go to an art gallery and you take a look at these uh, classic paintings of the crucifixion, in some paintings of the crucifixion, Jesus just looks really haggard and tortured and he, he looks like he's crying out in despair. And you see that kind of portrait in Mark 15. He's crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some people like to, to pit that against the other depiction where sometimes you see Jesus on the cross in a very commanding kind of pose, like he's in full control of what's going on. And you get that, uh, that feel in Luke uh, 23, for example, where he says, um, into, into your hands do I commit my spirit. As people try to pit that against each other sometime, how do we understand those two portrayals, Daryl, of Jesus on the cross? Well, the interesting thing is to take those two accounts and, and look at them in a synopsis and to look at what point in the crucifixion sequence, which we know lasted for hours, um, are we at any given point, depending on which version we're in. And what you find out very quickly is that Mark's, uh, my God, my God, why has you forsaken me remark, is very much on the earlier end of the time of the crucifixion. And then Mark actually has a remark in which he says, um, and a second time Jesus cried out. Mm -hmm. And that's all he says. Okay, he doesn't, he doesn't tell us what he said. He just said he cried out a second time. Mm. But when you look at it in the synopsis, the very slot where Mark has Jesus crying out a second time is exactly where Luke has his remark, into your hands I commend my spirit, which of course is coming right before the end of the sequence as he's dying. And he's really giving himself over to the Father for the vindication that that resurrection is going to represent. He's represented himself as saying to the leadership, you're going to put me to death, but God's going to vindicate me. And you're going to see that vindication. Mm -hmm. And so that last remark is that movement into that vindication space because he's going to die. And if he's going to come back to life, God's going to have to raise him from the dead. And so you get this shift in which the first saying from Mark is dealing with the sin question, if I can say it that way. And the second remark from Luke, that's a little more confident, is really a, the language of trust coming out of a psalm in which the psalmist is trusting God for his care. Um, and, uh, you know, it's entirely, I think it's entirely plausible that in the midst of this long sequence of crucifixion, you move from this despair about what Jesus is facing, which was already signaled in Gethsemane with his prayer, mm -hmm. you know, all the way over to, all right, this is it. So, uh, you know, I'm handing the baton off to you. You're going to you're going to either vindicate me or not here. And I'm trusting you to do what the plan says. So that's that's how I would put it together. I, I'm interested to see what Mike thinks, but that's how I would put it together. Hmm. Yeah, Mike, how would you respond to that? Well, uh, John is going to look at things, uh, quote him a little different. So, um now, I have to go back and look at Matthew and Mark, but it seemed to me that when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was a, a penultima statement of, of, of Jesus on the cross uh, right before he did the loud cry and died. But maybe Daryl's right here, um, but um, I, I seem to remember it a little bit differently. John, when you come to John, instead of saying, my God, why have you forsaken me? He says, I'm thirsty. That's the penultimate statement. And then, but the very last statement is, it is finished. So instead of saying, into, Father, into your hands, I entrust my spirit, he says, it is finished. Now, it, it means pretty much the same thing, uh, um, you could say, but it would show the extent to perhaps to which one of them, probably John, is paraphrasing. Um, and Johannine specialists, uh, all seem to agree that that John is um, he's reporting different uh, tradition in terms of the stories, but he's also doing some things with Jesus's words. So, for example, no one really questions the orthodoxy or conservatism of F. F. Bruce. F. F. Bruce, in his commentary on the Gospel of John and in introductory information uh, uh, material, says that what uh, John does with the Jesus tradition is it's a translation of the freest kind, it's an expanded paraphrase, and a transposition into another key. Hmm. 
Um, you've got uh, Paul Anderson, a, a Johannine specialist, saying he calls John a theological paraphrase. So, um, I, you know, John here, I think he's taking some of Jesus's words. And the reason we do find some some of the things like the crucifixion scene a little bit different. So um, you were talking about portraits. You know, Jesus is kind of in agony. Why have you forsaken me there at the end? Um, but in John, he's just kind of calm up on the cross. Even in the uh, in Gethsemane, you know, you've got Jesus real. He's sweating it. Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass for me. But that's not so in, in John's gospel. He's, he's pretty, uh, pretty passive in the garden. Um, so, it's it's almost like John airbrushes some of this stuff out. Jesus is worried, not completely from John at the end in the Passion narrative, but most of it. He just airbrushes it out, and he gives us a little different view of Jesus there, uh, perhaps to emphasize his deity. Hmm. Yeah, I think I, I think it's interesting to see, and and Mike's right to bring in John alongside of this because your original question was. Um, you know, what are we getting from Mark? Are we getting Psalm 22, verses one, verse 1, versus what we get in Luke from Psalm 31, verse, what, 5 or 6? And, and, the, and so that's one dimension is what's happening within the synoptics. But you put John next to it, and John is doing something different. I like to tell people when they think about this, and they think about paraphrasing and that kind of thing, and that can make them sometimes nervous, is to say, what – John is oftentimes doing is making explicit things that were implicit in what Jesus was saying as we get them in the synoptics. Hmm. Okay. So it's there. It's just that he's bringing it to attention and he's bringing it to attention because he started the story in a different place. Mm -hmm. I like to say that John tells the story of Jesus from heaven down. The synoptics tell the story of Jesus from earth up. Yeah. And the point that I'm making is in the synoptics, you watch it dawn on people who Jesus is, okay? And they grow in their understanding of him, and, and the writers almost present Jesus in such a way that you can watch that process happen, okay? But John, from the very first verse, tells you exactly what he's doing. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, this is <laughs> CNN. You know, right from the very first verse, you know where he's coming from in terms of his presentation of Jesus. He's the only one that has this extensive prologue that goes before even Jesus was born, that talks about his preexistence explicitly, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. That's not something someone historically experienced, if I can say it that way. That is a theological um, deduction based upon the confession that Jesus is divine. And so... Those are the kinds of moves that John is making uh, that help to fill out his portrait and, and that'll, that allow him, give him the, the room um, to, to, you know, to present this, if I can say, more explicit presentation of Jesus you know, in light of, and now I'm going to appeal to Paul Harvey, the rest of the story mm -hmm. you know, in terms of, uh, of what the um, – early church has come to see about who Jesus is. 